Hello, good morning everyone. I'm Will Charlton, Arable Marketing Manager for Lee McGrain UK. Um, welcome to our virtual Aussie Rape Tour this morning. Um, the session today will last for 45 minutes. We have a presentation for around about half an hour going through the plots um, uh, and some details around our traits. Um, and then there'll be time for around about 15 minutes of, of questions at the end of the session. Um, following this, there'll be a post event email where you can claim your basis and the Rosso points. Um, for those of you who requested a promotional pack, hopefully you've received it by now. Um, you'll see in there that we have a copy of our Aussie Rate Variety Guide. Um, and you'll see also in there that there is room to write notes on, on the various varieties and some extra detail on some of the traits which are, are in our varieties. Um, before I start, um, I'd just like to go through a few housekeeping points, if I may. So firstly, um, please ensure you adjust the volume to your preferred, preferred level using both the control panel at the bottom of the screen and your device controls. Another important point, please do not press pause at any time as you'll miss part of this event because when you press play again, you'll jump forward to the live moment. You can submit questions as we go um, uh, to be asked in the, answered in the Q&A session at any time by using the questions tab on the right hand side of your screen. If you cannot see this tab, then please press the small arrow in the top right corner of your screen. Um, we also have some poll questions which we'd like to ask you as we go through this morning. Um, if you see those, please do answer them if you're able. Um, so um, I'd like to introduce my colleague who's joining us this morning, Liam Wilkinson. He's Arable Technical Officer at Lee McGrain. Um, Liam actually drilled and did all the done all the agronomy on the trials, which we'll, we'll go through today. And he's also our Aussie Rape Technical Expert. So good morning, Liam. Morning, Will. And morning, everyone. Um, so obviously, it'd be better to do this in person. Um, but I think being online, it gives us an opportunity um, to talk around some different things, um, namely the traits that we've put into our varieties. Um, so as we go through the presentation, you'll see, and as I'm sure you're aware, we are in a fairly dominating position on the recommended list at the minute with terms of varieties. Um, so instead of going through the varieties one by one, I thought that the best way to approach this was to talk about the varieties, uh, the traits that we've stacked into these, and then sort of differentiate them at the end as to where they sort of fit on farm. So hopefully you'll take something out of it this morning. Uh, just a brief overview of what I'm going to cover. Um, so we'll just do a quick introduction, um, an overview of the traits um, that we've been talking about in the press and that you'll see um, sort of mentioned. Um, a look at Vigor, it's something that we've been working on this year. Um, sort of we're in a position where we can now start to really pull these varieties apart we know that they're there for yield performance and how can we use the best characteristics of these varieties on farm um, and make it work on farm for you um, a quick look at the varieties obviously you've got if you've applied you've got a variety book uh, in front of you and um, there's a space on there for notes and stuff so please feel free just to write away and there's a lot of information on our website as well. And I'm not going to reread really the recommended list to you. Um, I'm just going to explain a few things that we see these diff varieties different and where they fit. And then at the end, just a quick Q&A. Um, there's a few questions been submitted already and then we'll post any questions that have been asked in the chat through the event. So just a quick overview. Um, all seed rapes are a relatively new crop in the UK. Um, we've been working on hybrids um, commercially since 2006 and it's probably one of the crops that's seen the most innovation through that time um, up to present day uh, with resistance to FOMA identified in genes uh, with RLM genes. Uh, 2012 we saw the introduction of club root resistance, uh, we introduced Alasco into the marketplace. 2010 we had pod shatter resistance. Uh, 2014 was probably the turning point uh, for Limograin uh, when we uh, identified TUIV resistance and we were the first breeders to introduce Amelie into the, commercially into the market, which had that TUIV resistance. Since then, we've sort of kept pace with technology moving forwards. We've got um, herbicide tolerance through the clear field. And then last year, we launched the nitrogen use efficiency or the NFLEX characteristic, uh, which work is ongoing with at the minute. And it's worked. We're, we're in a dominating position on the recommended list. And recent data shows that we are sort of the, we are the biggest breeder, the number one breeder in Europe uh, for, in terms of oilseed rape. And looking at the UK recommended list, it's a fairly um, dominating position. It's been an, it's been a difficult task this year actually to sort of get get to pull the varieties apart. Um, but with the top seven UK recommended varieties all coming from the Limograin portfolio, 
Um, it's evident that what we're doing is working. Um, sort of a UK-based breeding program, screen, and everything going through sort of the trial system here, um, and it's worked. We've got sort of the top seven rec uh, top seven UK recommended. Um, if we look at the east, uh, sorry, this is the north south divide. Um, so what I've done on this graph is I've plotted um, every RL trial location, and then colour coded as to where those trials sit and which data set they feed into. Uh, so the red dots uh, feed into the east west region. Uh, and the blue dots into the north. So many people in Yorkshire will probably think that they are classed as the north. In terms of that north-south divide, it actually sits about Scotch Corner. Uh, so when you're looking at the data sets, it's just worth bearing that in mind um, as looking where your varieties fit or where the data for your region has been pulled from. So if we look at the east-west region, um, again, a fairly commanding position. Um, expectation and respect spoil in the party a little bit. Um, but eight of the top 10 varieties is nothing to be sniffed at. And, and with new additions this year in LG Aviron and LG Antigua, coming in at second and third in the east-west region, um, alongside Ambassador, which is, is outright high shield in the east-west. And it's not just the east-west. Um, we breed for the north as well. We have screening trials all over the UK. Uh, we're particularly strong on light leaf spot resistance. I think this is probably shows in these northern results uh, where I really was the outright high shielding um, but the top six varieties are all from the LG stable as well again at Veyron um, added in there as the only as one of the only UK recommended varieties to be added last year so as you can see we have a big portfolio uh, it's not that easy to talk about to be honest and the way that we're going to talk about this is talking about and breaking down the genetics um, that we've done in there which is not something that we often talk about um, face to face it's more about the varieties um, but I just wanted to show you the work that we're doing around those traits and sort of the support that we're offering alongside it. So LG Genetics, um, sort of the breeding target is to secure and achieve yield. Uh, yield is nothing without the security that comes with it. And I think that's what's important with, with our genetics. Everything that we have stacked into these varieties is to help get that, get that variety to final yield, uh, whether that's resistance to TUIV, pod shatter, uh, RLM7 um, and then the NFLEX in sort of our elite lines is all about securing that yield yield potential that we know we have in the varieties. So just a quick look at TYV. This is something that we first introduced with Amelie, but TYV, as I'm sure you're aware, is a virus transmitted by aphids, so Mises persicae, uh, and the infection can occur both in the autumn and the spring. Um, symptoms are not normally seen until the spring uh, and are often misdiagnosed as threshold deficiency. Um, also, rape has a horrible habit of going purple at the first time of any stress, um, but some of the, the sort of the symptoms of TYV are stunted plants, uh, reddening, uh, reduced branching, fewer seeds, uh, and in some of our trials we've seen yield penalties of up to 30% where the infection has been high. Um, so it's once a virus has been, once a plant's been infected, uh, the virus can no longer be controlled. Uh, um, so the, the only resistance really is sort of controlling the aphids or genetic resistance. So TYV resistance in our in our varieties. So it's resistance that does prevent the multiplication and the spread of the virus. So any new tissue that is formed does not have the virus, um, unlike tolerances. And this was first introduced from stubble turnips using conventional crossing methods. Um, and it was first made commercially available by Limograin in Amelie back in 2015. And now it's sort of a staple breeding target of both our European and UK breeding programs. Um, anything that we bring through now will does have TUIV resistance and it's on all of our sort of high ger uh, elite germplasm. Uh, considering the widespread resistance to insecticides that's sort of forming with aphids, um, our view is that TUIV resistance in a variety should be the foundation of any IPM strategy on farm. And there's no longer a yield penalty for growing a variety with um, TUIV resistance. All of the top yielding varieties do have, have that genetic in there. So it really is a free security um, that we're offering to growers. And it is that security against against the virus. So we know we have this trait, but Limograin were the first breeders. And so since 2015, we've analysed 600 fields across Europe, um, both in the autumn and the spring, um, to monitor the sort of the the spread of TUIV or where it is. Um, as you can see in sort of those the Eastern Bloc countries across sort of the on the continent, um, it's fairly endemic with 100% infection. 
Um, whereas if we go toward the spring 2019 results, uh, we had fairly high levels. Uh, we had 84% infection uh, in the UK, uh, which was probably the highest we've seen. And what we've seen from the data so far is that not every year is a TUIV year, uh, the same year that not every year is a bad mid-year. Um, so if we go forward to the spring 2020 results, um, you can see the locations were slightly limited. Um, thanks to COVID, we couldn't get out and get the samples that we wanted to. Um, but the high infection was highest in the southeast, and we had an average of 35% infection across the UK, uh, so markedly lower than 2019. Um, so what we're saying is that not every year necessarily will be a TUIV year, um, but what you can do is secure your yield uh, with the resistance in some in our hybrids and our conventionals as well uh, against yield loss um, if it is to be a TUIV year. So the next trait that I'm just going to cover is pod shatter. So pod shatter I consider to be one of the most important traits in our in our material. Um, you can look after oilseed rape. It's a stressful crop to grow. We know it is. Um, there's a lot that can go wrong with oilseed rape, and there is risk involved. To get it to harvest and it to, to for those pods to shatter a couple of days before harvest and lose lose yield um, would be galling as a grower. Uh, and we have the genetics in there to help prevent that. And I think it, this has been sort of identified by the HDB. Uh, this year is the first year that it's been recognised as an agronomic trait on the recommended list, which does just show the importance that this trait uh, has uh, to growers. So pod shatter is a natural process. It's quite hard. To, it's a difficult thing to breed out because the plant's natural goal is to is to disperse seed. Um, as you can see, on the right hand side, you've got sort of that diagram of, of the um, pod. And what happens as that pod gets wet and dry is that those tension points become brittle. Um, so as the pod expands and dries, and that's when you get untimely crop loss. So from hailstorms, adverse weather, or the header passing through the crop, um, you can sort of see um, untimely and sometimes quite large seed losses in crops. Um, so we introduced pod shatter resistance into into um, orchid rape par hybrids uh, from a radish along with the restorer gene and not all of our hybrids have uh, have pod shatter but all the hybrids that we bring to market do and i think that's the important thing and it just shows you how important we view uh, this trait to be so is all pod shatter resistance the same um in a word, no. Um, some one of our colleagues in Germany did some testing, and, and what they used is they used a tensiometer to split and measured the force required to split a right pod. And what we saw that although we know we have the we have that genetic markers, we have the resistances to pod shatter. Uh, what we saw within that that there was levels of resistance, particularly when looking across other competitive varieties. So we have the genetic markers, um, but we are still dedicated to testing to make sure that our varieties stand up um, to the standards that we set um, so that when we bring them on the farm, that as much risk is mitigated as possible. So looking at the advantage of pod shatter, so this is probably one of the best pod shatter trials I've seen. I don't think it was meant to be a pod shatter trial, um, but this was in France last year uh, and they had massive hailstorm about a week before harvest. So the pods were completely ripe. Um, where, the, where the plots are white, you can see all the seed is stripped out. Um, so what we're saying is this is obviously another level of security, as with all our genetics. Um, it's around security, around a delayed harvest. And it makes that crop more resilient to repeated wetting and drying, particularly with the catchy harvests that we've seen over the, over the last few years. And ultimately, it helps reduce volunteers in the following crop from that. But the important thing is the less, pot, the less seed on the floor, the more seed in the barn. I'm just going to talk next about NFLEX. The NFLEX is a characteristic that was launched um, by Limograin last year. And it's in three of our hybrid varieties. So NFLEX varieties have increased nitrogen use efficiency. And what that does is it allows the crop to better utilise available nitrogen, even when levels are suboptimal. And again, this offers yield security around delayed or suboptimal nitrogen applications. Um, as a company, what we're saying is we don't, want to be reducing nitrogen inputs um, that's not the goal and that's not the talking point around nflex and um, what we're saying is is that these varieties have a security 
um, when sort of field conditions don't allow um, nitrogen to be applied at the optimal timings or rates. And as I said, it's currently in, we've identified it in three of our hybrid lines. So Ambassador, Aviron, and then recently this year, we've added Antigua to that list. So what is nitrogen use efficiency? Again, um, it's how every unit of nitrogen in the soil or applied is absorbed, assimilated and remobilized um, by the plant and turned into available into grain yield. And I think it's important to note that nitrogen use efficiency or this, this NFLEX is a, a culmination of the best of our traits that we offer. It's every single point where we've sort of reduced the risk of losing yield, um, we've managed to do that. So what we're doing is in effect turning as much nitrogen into yield. Um, if pod shatter isn't in the variety, can you claim NUE? If you've lost yield, you've lost nitrogen. Um, so you haven't got a good NUE. Um, these varieties have got the best genetics that we have to offer. Um, and it's mitigated as much risk. So there's as many as limited sort of points to lose yield as possible. And as I said, the NUE target is not, is the, and the point of NFLEX is not around reducing nitrogen. I think that's really important to get across. Um, we're saying that these varieties still have an optimal M level. Um, what we've seen with the breeding data is that they have a flatter uh, response curve. Um, so typically a, a rape variety will have a sort of a nitrogen response curve. What we've seen is that the, character, the varieties that we've labeled with NFLEX have a flatter response curve. So they still have the optimal M, which we should be aiming for, um, but there is a smaller yield penalty for getting that level wrong um, that there isn't with other varieties. So there is still a yield penalty for reducing nitrogen. Uh, we're not saying that, but what we're saying is that the yield penalty is smaller uh, with varieties that we have uh, identified as having this NFLEX characteristic. And how do we identify it? So currently, we'll, I think, the breeding team are working on genetic markers. I think it's a, it's a very, very complicated process to sort of label label them to. Um, so at the minute, what we're doing is we do it through screening processes over multiple years. And what we're looking for is varieties that have high yield in optimal conditions, um, but also conserve a high percentage of that yield when the yield when the nitrogen levels are suboptimal. Um, so what we're looking for is those varieties that sit in that top right-hand corner. Um, so as you can see, high yielding, on the x-axis um, but on the sort of in terms of yield conservation um, they're good as well and these are just some pictures so we've induced nitrogen stresses into some of our trials uh, this is from france in 2017 where you can see an nflex hybrid on the right hand side uh, com uh, on the left hand side sorry uh, compared to a control variety so these were an induced nitrogen stress of an 80 kilogram deficit uh, which is far and beyond anything that we would expect to go wrong on farm, uh, which is why we're labeling it as a security. Um, but we have just pushed this to the limits just to see what the how the genetics stack up. And as you can see, the plant on the left uh, is a lot healthier. There's a lot more leaf tissue there, more branching, more flowers, uh, and ultimately uh, greater yield. So I just wanted to share with you the LG Antigua data um, just to show what we're saying about reducing nitrogen. So as you can see on the x-axis, that's the yield in optimal end conditions. Uh, all units um, for reference are in decitons. Uh, so, point, so 46 decitons is 4.6 tons. Um, so as you can see, LG Antigua optimally yields just over 46 decitons. Suboptimally is down at 36. So there is a yield penalty, but what we're showing is, is that the yield penalty is smaller. It's a less yield penalty uh, for getting your nitrogen wrong. Uh, with an NFLEX characteristic. And this translates as well when we've sort of induced high stress levels. So um, what we've done on farm this year is that we've sort of got 18 farmer trials set up um, looking at reducing nitrogen by 15% um, tram on tranline trials. Um, as 15% is around where we see the most that's the most that anyone would possibly get all seed rape nutrition wrong by. It's a, tip, it's a very difficult crop to get nutrition right in, um, but 15% is, is still quite considerable. Uh, but what we've done in our trials, so this is four years testing across France, UK and Germany. Uh, and what we've done is we've induced high nitrogen levels of nitrogen stress. So up to 130 kilograms deficit in high nitrogen stress. So as you can see, as we said, there is a yield penalty for reducing nitrogen with these varieties. Um, 
which is not the story, but the security compared to other varieties is there. So as you can see, at sort of an, an optimal uh, Antigua out yields of controls by uh, two decitons, um, and then down at the strong end stress, it still out yields the controls. Um, so that's what we're saying is that this is a security. It's another level of security to add to TUIV, to add to pod shatter, to add to RLM7, um, to ensure that or your seed rape crop, um, which we know is risky to grow, um, and growers may be on an R in. Um, but with our genetics, we believe that we have given growers every tool available um, to get that crop to harvest. So that's just a brief overview of our traits. Um, there's some information in the RC rate variety guide that went round, which you should have in front of you as well. So, And there's also information on our website for those as well. So the next topic I'm just going to cover is, is vigor. Um, vigor is something that we've been talking about. Um, vigor is a widely used term, um, but what actually is it? Um, a brief Google um, brings up a lot of things, and it's something that we've probably been guilty of ourselves in just labeling something of having exceptional vigor. Um, but what does it mean? And I think what we've sort of done this year is that we've proven ourselves. We've, we've got the highest yielding varieties in the marketplace. Um, how can we pull our varieties apart further and make sure that they are doing the best on farm as possible. So this was just a quick Google. As you can see, it's a widely banded around term, but finding a definition that is quite difficult. Um, so vigor is a highly desired trait by the trade and growers. And um, we know it is. The questions are, what's your most vigorous hybrid? That's uh, what's your most vigorous variety that coming in? If you ask a grower to define vigor, it's very subjective. Um, all companies measure vigor differently. Um, AHDB, there's no clear definition um, they don't report vigor on their on the RL. They do on their one year harvest results, uh, which is a one to nine score. Um, but one is defined as no vigor and one, nine is defined as vigorous. And again, it's subjective. Um, so what we're looking at is normally with um, when people mention vigor, they're looking at biomass um, and it's at one time of year without really any picture or sort of story about how that variety get there. And what we know is that our varieties all work differently. Um, they offer different drill timings, they offer different sowing rates, things like that. So what we're saying is, is that there's more to vigour than just biomass, and I think that's important to get across. So what we've developed is, is an autumn dynamic growth process uh, where we're looking at emergence, um, early vigour, and then that high winter biomass. So all of our, win all of our varieties will get to that winter biomass um, so what we're saying for optimal performance, you need to have at least eight leaves going into the autumn, eight millimetres of collar um, above the soil, and then 15 centimetre taproot. Uh, and all of our varieties will get there, um, but how they get there is slightly different. And that's where sort of knowing the varieties um, it really comes into play and sort of picking the best variety for your situation and your drilling date and your farm. So looking at those, those points, it gives us three timings. Um, so establishment, three to four leaves, uh, eight leaves, which is that winter biomass. And that gives us two key speeds. And we know how fast the variety pro can progress between those points. Um, so that speed to three to four leaves, that's the key time really to withstand adult flea beetle damage, um, adult grazing damage. Once a variety is past sort of that three to four leaf stage, uh, we're fairly confident that a variety is safe from adult grazing damage. And then looking at that speed to gain winter biomass. And that's looking at how fast it can gain enough biomass to tolerate larval damage uh, from the flea beetle. So it's moving from the adult to the larval is that key stage. Um, that winter biomass also gives us better winter hardiness and better weed suppression. So often misguided with the winter hardiness is the importance of the root. The root's probably the most important thing with winter hardiness. Uh, so getting that tap root down with a good collar uh, allows the variety to sort of store carbohydrates and really make the most of the energy. So as soon as those day lengths start changing in the spring, um, it can start growing away in, yeah, with spring vigour. But knowing how these varieties get to these points affects sowing date and agronomic practice. Um, and it puts you uh, as growers, agronomists, uh, to put your, to manage your crop with them in, in, for, in a in more informed position, which I think is important. As we said, also rapes are a relatively new crop. Um, it often hasn't been treated the best, uh, to be honest. It's often been chucked in and sort of crossed your fingers. I think the prices are good at the minute. I think it should be treated as the sort of the high value crop it is. 
and knowing your variety is probably the most important stage to that as it is with wheat and as it is with cereal crops or any other crop is to that fact you wouldn't just pick your variety and throw it in and hope for the best i think it really is sort of getting down to right this variety fits this situation i'm going to do this uh, if you're going to grow all seed rape give it the best shot you've got and pick the best genetics for your situation so just looking at some of our varieties and how these fit, um, this is LG Aviron, so our new UK recommended variety. Um, as you can see, very quick autumn establishment. So establishes it to be fair at the same rate as, as all varieties. Um, and once it starts growing, it, it doesn't stop. Uh, and for that reason, um, as you can see, it gets that three to four leaf stage very quickly. And then it keeps on a, that trajectory up to that three to eight, up to that eight leaf stage. And for that reason, we know that LG Aviron, if, conditions are right uh, it shouldn't be drilled too early um, it, if you drill early with LG Aviron uh, you can end up with quite a large biomass in the winter uh, which might, might require managing which if you know it requires managing you can deal with it it's when you just don't expect it that's when the problems occur um, but what this variety offers uh, and what all our varieties with this sort of high vigor or this high quick autumn dynamic growth is is a security level again um, I think gone are the days where you drill into a dust bowl and hope for the best. I think these hybrids have such good um, sort of vigour and growth habits is that it offers you security to wait sort of a week. Uh, if you know that rain's on the forecast in a week's time, uh, there's no need to drill at, on the 1st of September anymore or in the middle of August. If you've got your drilling by calendar date, if you know rain's coming in the next seven to ten days, uh, with these high-performing sort of quick establishing uh, hybrids which accrue biomass very quickly um, you can afford to wait until the conditions are right um, no variety is sort of dust bowl proof um, there's no variety out there like that and I think if with these varieties it's about putting them in the best situation and knowing what you've got and I think with the varieties with high vigor or this high autumn dynamic growth uh, you can wait con until conditions are right to drill and give your sh uh, crop the best um, chance to grow and keep growing away from any potential damage so slightly different is ambassador so it's slightly slower to that three to four leaf but not but not excessively so and then quicker weight from the larval damage um, but what this does is it offers you a chance to drill slightly earlier than a veron and knowing that means that you can drill if you are intent on drilling sort of first week of august um, you can do that with this variety not a problem uh, and you won't have as much of a canopy to manage as you would with a veron and then moving on to Aurelia as well. So Aurelia is sort of a mainstay, but it's a little bit different in terms of our varieties. Um, when it gets to that biomass, it sits. Uh, and this is the importance of knowing. So it gets to that. So in terms of earlier drilling, uh, it will drill earlier. Um, but once it gets to that final biomass, so that overwintering biomass, it tends to sit back uh, uh, for the winter. Unlike a Veron, which keeps growing and you might have to manage a canopy, Aurelia sort of sits back a little bit, uh, um, which is useful to know. And it's, then again, that's the importance of knowing your varieties and knowing which ones um, fit the situations best. So that's it for the for the traits. Um, what I'm briefly going to do is I've picked out a couple of the key our key varieties. Obviously, I can't do every single one because we'd be here till about ten o'clock. Um, uh, but again, all the information is on our website, and hopefully, we'll see you over the summer at some point. We can talk about them in person. Um, but what we've done is we've put together a couple of videos um, for the varieties. So the first uh, variety I'm going to talk about is Ambassador. So Ambassador, again, one of our fully loaded hybrids uh, with TYV resistance, pod shatter, RLM7 and NFLEX. Uh, and Ambassador is the number one highest yielding variety in the UK. Uh, it's outright highest yielding in the East West as well. And what it is, is it's just got four years farm data behind it now. It's an established variety on farm. Growers know this variety, growers trust this variety. And at a time when all seed rape is, is a sort of a sensitive topic, uh, people are umming and are in, I think that the key of being sort of that established variety uh, will have a lot of weight in picking which varieties are picked this coming year. Next up is Aviron. So LG Aviron is our another fully loaded hybrid. It was our new uh, addition to the UK recommended list. It was listed as an east-west candidate and then got upgraded to a uk recommended variety because of its exceptional performance last year so this is probably our most consistent variety across regions um, again high joint high yielding on the recommended list with ambassador um, but it's second in the east-west region and second in the north as well so both the joint high slightly spot score 7.4 
Um, and again, with good genetic resistance, so RLM7 plus good quantitative resistances, NFLEX, TOIV resistance, and pod shatter resistance. Um, LG Antigua is the next variety. So LG Antigua has gone on an East West recommended variety, um, and it's gone on as third highest yield in that East West region. Um, and to be honest, this is a very good, probably a, a, one of our best varieties. Different growth habit offers a chance for slightly early drilling because it sits back in the autumn. Once it's, excuse me, once it's got back to that autumn biomass, it sits back a little bit, um, unlike other varieties. Um, but it is the earliest maturing variety on the recommended list. Um, mid flowering, so protection from the late frosts that we've seen, um, but that early maturity, uh, which just offers you a, something a little bit different on farm if you're looking to turn fields around quickly or beat the catchy harvests. Next up is Aurelia. So Aurelia is was the number one hybrid in the marketplace last year um, and is sort of a proven popular variety with growers. Um, it's the outright highest yielding variety in the north, again with TYV, pod shatter and RLM7 and joint highest light leaf spot resistance with Aviron. So again, 7.4 for light leaf spot, good FOMA resistance. And this is a really robust variety. Uh, in the recent frost we've seen, this stood up really well. Um, it's a more waxy plant type um, and it just it looked a, sort of stood a lot better, slightly later to um, flower. Um, but yeah, all around good variety. And I think, again, um, like with Ambassador, it's got that on farm, proven on farm, proven on trial performance. Um, so going forward this year, uh, where there is a glut of candidates, I think one of the, this will be, remain one of the biggest varieties in the marketplace. So we'll move on to our conventionals next. Um, so with Acacia. So Acacia was the outright highest yielding variety last year on the UK recommended list, and it certainly has something about it. Um, it's one of the most robust varieties we have. Um, good disease resistance for light leaf spot, foam is slightly lower. Um, but in terms of robust plant type, good sort of good autumn dynamic growth, um, offers a wide drilling window uh, from early to late. Uh, and again, stood up well to those late harv uh, late frosts. Um, but again, proven on-farm performance, I think is going to be crucial going forwards in variety selection. Next up is Aspire. So Aspire is the only conventional variety that's recommended that has TUIV resistance. Um, so again, this, Aspire often gets labelled as, a, as a, um, a slower variety. But what it does is it's a robust a ro really robust, resilient plant type. So it offers that opportunity for earlier drilling. Uh, TYV resistance for early drilling is crucial, uh, particularly in the east-west region. Um, but in terms of an outright early driller, robust plant type, Aspire is probably the variety to pick. And then lastly is a new variety from us, uh, which is LG Anarion. So Anarion is something different from us. And this is a new addition, uh, which will be available this year. And this is a club root variety. Uh, which is also fully loaded. So we managed to get TYV resistance, pod shatter resistance, RLM7 resistance in, into a club root resistant variety, which is quite an exciting um, market for us. It's quite an exciting for the, for the UK market. And what we've done is we've really managed to cl close um, that yield gap that's previously been seen with club root varieties. So from our data last year, we had it in trial with NIAB. Uh, and with Lim and in our own breeding network, um, we saw it was compatible with, comparable with some of our best hybrids. So it was up there with sort of Artemis and the, and the likes. Um, but what we have seen, it's an 11% increase on, on Alaska, which is our previous offering in the club root market, and a 5% increase over some of the current commercial club root varieties. So I think that combination of TYV, pod shatter, RLM7, club root, it's a step forward and it's a game changer really for that club root market. Uh, the club root market held last year. Um, so the acreage held, the overall oil seed acreage, oil seed rape acreage fell away. Um, that club root remained stable. And what we're doing is we're offering security that another level of security to those growers um, that previously haven't had it. So that's an exciting sort of entry for us this year uh, and something that we'll be talking about further. So we also have two new candidates. So we have a good portfolio, well established on the recommended list, and we haven't quite stopped there. So we have two uh, hybrid candidates this year in LG Auckland and LG Areti. Uh, so LG Auckland is a UK candidate, very good disease profile, again, fully loaded, TYV, pod shatter, and RLM7. 
and it's got exceptional sort of autumn growth and sort of that spring vigor as well is very good uh, and it's more the ambassador type uh, of plant uh, El Gioretti uh, east west candidate very good FOMA scores likely spot slightly lower than Auckland um, but still very good uh, and again TYV pod shatter and RLM7 with all our, as with all our varieties this variety is a little bit different for us it offers the opportunity for autumn for a hybrid that genuinely early drills it sits back in the autumn it was sort of slower developing in that autumn time um, didn't suffer from flea beetle damage in the trials that we saw um, but the difference with this variety is, is how quick it is in the spring as soon as those day lengths started changing it absolutely rocketed away so any potential pigeon or flea beetle larval damage that was there uh, we managed to grow away from and again that's that more aurelia plant type it sits back We still have more candidates. So we've got two new conventional candidates. Um, so we are still breeding for the conventional market. Conventional conventionals on the recommended list are dwindling away now. There's not many of them there, but what we're managing to do is move those traits into conventionals. Uh, so we have Amarone, which is a UK candidate, um, and Annika, which is an East West, both crucially with that TYV resistance. Um, so a level of security that other than Aspire, we've not previously seen with the conventional varieties uh, from anything else in the marketplace. So Annika is more an Aspire type, so a slower speed of growth and offers an opportunity uh, for early drilling with a very good disease resistance. Uh, and Amarone is more your Acacia Aardvark type with an early maturity. So then again, that offers a wider drilling window, lets you drill slightly later than you would with Annika. Um, data was limited last year from the trials. Um, so this year will really be a test of everything, to be honest. Um, there wasn't um, so this year will remain to be seen, but from what the data we've seen is that there are two very, well, all four are very strong candidates uh, going forward. Um, so hopefully with this year's data sets, uh, we'll have those to introduce next year. Lastly, um, we have a Clearfield, con uh, Clearfield candidate, LG Constructor CL. Uh, so this is Limograin's first Clearfield variety with TYV and pod shatter. Uh, mid to early maturity. Uh, I think the key for this variety is its short stiff stems. It's a nine for uh, nine for lodging and nine for stem stiffness, uh, which for hybrids is quite rare. And it's a shorter hybrid as well. So for ease of management in terms of harvesting and combining, this variety offers offers something different from the bigger hybrids. And what it does crucially is it adding another level of security. So you've got that TYV and pod shatter uh, from our other varieties uh, now in the Clearfield, uh, Clearfield sector. Uh, it hasn't got RLM7, so the FOMA in the autumn will require monitoring. Um, but again, in terms of a, an easier to manage variety, um, LG Constructor CL certainly offers that opportunity. And that's my presentation. If there's, and I think we'll go to some quick, uh, question and answer session. Fantastic. Thanks, Liam. Um, that was excellent. Lots of um, really positive comments um, coming through on the, um, the chat from those watching. Um, we do have quite a lot of questions. You perhaps wouldn't be surprised to know, um, <laughs> given given the the scale of the and depth of the presentation. Um, just firstly, before we do that, I, I was posting some polls just whilst we were um, going through. Um, so um, the first one I, I asked was, what would you consider has been the biggest development in all seed rate breeding in the last ten years? Um, and um, leading that was actually TUIV resistance at 47% of those that, that replied to that poll. So um, that was quite a way ahead of the number two, which was then pod shatter um, with then clear fields um, uh, and um, enhanced nitrogen use efficiency quite a way behind. So really that TUIV um, for those watching this morning has been the most compelling um, uh, of, of the, the new introductions over the last 10 years from your, your first, your first chart. Yeah, no, it's it's good, and it's a sort of a staple inclusion of all our varieties now moving forward. Um, anything that we're sort of bringing to market has that TYV resistance. So we've identified the importance of it, and it's something that we're going to continue bringing to market. Yes, brilliant. And then I asked, um, what characteristic or trait would you consider a must-have in any variety you grow? And that was very much split four ways, um, evenly. 25% uh, to TYV resistance. 25% said excellent vigour. Um, 23% said light leaf spot or FOMA score greater than seven. 21% said pod shatter resistance within club root and clear field, which are perhaps more more um, niche requirements at four and 3% respectively. So very much 
Gro is looking for TUIV resistance, excellent vigor, good disease resistance, and pod shatter resistance, um, uh, all built in. Yeah, which it sort of sums up our fully loaded approach. And we don't offer anything on the recommended list lower than a six for likely spot. Um, and the fact that we have as many UK recommended varieties as we do uh, shows that we've managed to hit the sort of the high levels that sort of the high standards that are required to get a variety recommended for the north, which is good to see. And then finally, just very quickly before we go to questions, um, so what does target drilling day impact on your, how does target drilling day impact on your variety selection? Um, overwhelmingly, 43% of those that answered said, the later I drill, the more vigorous a variety I look for, um, which ties in quite well with, with what you were talking about. Yeah, and that's what we've been saying, is sort of knowing your variety if your situation is important. Yeah, great. Um, so, yeah, we have a few questions. Um, for those of you watching, I propose we're five to nine now. So I propose, if you don't mind, we'll, we'll overrun, by, but only by five minutes. So we'll finish at five past nine, if that's OK with everybody. Uh, I realise it's the beginning of May and it's a busy time for for, for everyone um, with field work and field walking, etc. cetera. Um, uh, so the first one, very topical, um, coming in various guises questions but when we had submitted pre which kind of wraps up in several others questions um which was uh, from jennifer from yorkshire it was are there some aussie rape varieties more frost pro more frost proof than others and there was a couple of other questions around do we screen our varieties for frost tolerance so and any thoughts on that that liam please um so firstly in terms of screening um Obviously, we're a UK breeding program, but we're also a European breeding program. Um, so all of our hybrid material and some of our conventionals are screened on the continent uh, where they have exceptionally harsh winters. Um, so sort of Poland this year, I think, got down to minus 14 at some points. Um, so in terms of screening for winter, hard, winter hardiness, um, we certainly do screen for that on the continent. Um, we test it to sort of the extremes. In terms of frost proof uh, varieties, this year has been difficult. Um, there's no getting away from it. I think it's the coldest April since the 80s uh, that we've had. I think we had a ground frost here again this morning. Um, as we've driven for sort of earlier, more vigorous varieties, those early flowering varieties have looked more susceptible in the frosts. Uh, whereas those varieties which have sat back a little bit have sort of stood up better to the frosts that we've seen recently. Um, going forwards, I think Orsi Rape has an, a fantastic ability to compensate. Um, we've got plots down here at Rothwell, which were sort of wilted after the frost that we saw week, uh, sort of night after night. Uh, the recent rain, in, the rain from the last couple of days has really perked them up and they started coming back around. Um, so, yes, we do screen for varieties. Um, in terms of frost proof, sort of pick a later, later flowering variety um, to be more frost proof. Um, but in terms of winter hardiness and that winter hardiness, all our varieties stand up to that well. Great. Thanks, Liam. Question. Yes. Yeah, no, I, I believe it does. Yes. Um, uh, obviously, always a hot topic whenever we, we talk uh, technically around Aussie rape, and that's around um, cabbage stem flea beetle. Um, there's been a couple of questions come in, but again, there was a question submitted before the event by Richard from Essex saying, are any varieties showing more resilience against cabbage stem flea beetle? And Liam, there's been a couple of questions just related to that as well um, around larvae attack in the spring and um, uh, uh, any kind of differences or benefits from various varieties? Firstly, uh, in terms of variety uh, res resilience against flea beetle uh, or varieties that are sort of flea beetle proof, um, there's been a couple of claims banded around and I, th I don't think that's the case. I think we've, we've done the work with slugs. This work with slug damage has been done in the past in terms of um, sort of slugs preferring certain varieties of wheat. If you drill a field of it and they've got nothing else to eat, they're still going to go for it. So in terms of saying a variety is less palatable, less is less valuable to flea beetle is a big claim. And unless the data is there where you've done no choice testing um, against multi-choice testing where the flea beetle have literally nothing else to eat other than that rape, um, I don't think you can claim that. In terms of resilience, uh, we've done work. Um, and what we've seen is that some plants do cope better with the damage, uh, one of them being a spire. So a spire is a really different plant type. It's a robust plant type and you can sort of kick bits off it and it, it just keeps coming back and still yields. Um, we had a crop with Tim Lammerman 
um, that sort of in places had he was going to write it off in places had sort of two plants per square meter and still did over six ton um, in some of the trials we've done um, Aspire has had the most flea beetle damage uh, going in the spring looking at larval damage and has still yielded the highest in those trials so in terms of resilience against flea beetle yes we have varieties uh, in terms of Aspire which is that robust plant type um, but looking forward I don't think there is anything so it's a big claim to make saying that a variety is flea beetle proof. Um, in terms of biomass, I think biomass is the key for surviving larval damage. Uh, what we've seen, or what I've seen this year when I've been looking at trials is that there is larval damage out there this spring. Um, where the biomass has been sufficient or big enough, the larvae have been contained to the petioles and the leaves, and they've been quite happy in there. Um, it's when the, the larvae or like we saw last year, the plants were so small because of the back, the awful conditions in the autumn uh, and the awful growing conditions is that larvae f had no choice but to migrate into the stem. And that's when you get the catastrophic crop losses. I think if you've got sufficient biomass, like we're saying about the eight leaves, the big collar uh, and the big taproot, if larvae can stay in the leaves, they're not an issue there in the PTO. It's when they migrate into the stem that they become a problem. So again, picking the right variety, getting it off to the best start and getting that winter biomass is key for tolerating any larval damage. Great. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Liam. Yeah, no, that um very well covered. Um uh we're getting close to time. Um uh perhaps uh one here that we had um uh, by Colin from, from Yorkshire. Um uh where where do you see Orsi Rape Area going forward regarding establishment pressure and then also perhaps a comment around X farm prices given where, where they've gone. So perhaps if you've got any, any comments, Liam, maybe relating to your vigour um, part of your presentation around establishment pressure and um, looking ahead to this I, this summer. I think the key for establishment this this summer is is the ground conditions. I, I think we have the genetics there, the vigour is there. We have all these traits stacked into these varieties. Use them, but use them properly. Don't drill into a dust bowl. If you see that if the ground conditions aren't suitable, don't drill, don't drill your crop, wait until the conditions are right. These hybrids will drill later than the conventionals that people have been used to. And I think that's some that mentality that we need to get across is that early drilling has always sort of was favoured, but above and above most is drilling into the right conditions into a moist seed bed, moisture available. If there's moisture available, all seed rate will chit and grow and start growing in sort of two or three days make sure it's got the conditions to keep growing and it will it will be it will it will look after itself um, it's when you sort of put it into stress situations from the start there's no variety out there that can overcome overcome that management system um, but in terms of sort of acreage for next year i don't know if you want to make a comment but i think the price is <laughs> the price is very good at the minute and also rape looks good out in the fields and i think i think we might start to see a little bit of resurgence or i hope we do anyway hmm. And we we're we're told by those in in the know that you know the prices, although perhaps it'll go down a bit of harvest, but it looks fairly buoyant for for the following harvest as well. So um, yeah, prospects at least in in returns if we can establish crops are are good for also rape going forward for the next cropping year. Definitely, it's a high value crop, and I think it's important that people treat it as such. Hmm. Yeah. Great. Well, Liam, thank you ever so much. Um, we do have quite a lot of questions still here. Um, what, what I suggest, um, firstly, apologies if we haven't been able to answer your question directly. What we'll endeavour to do is maybe group them together. There are still some questions around about around similar topics, um, and we'll try and um, group them together and and um, uh, do a Q and A type type document if that's possible um, to send around to you that that are viewed today. Um, also, if I may go to the, the last um, outro slide, please, um, just to say um, uh, also there's opportunity, COVID regulations permitting, we do have open days. Um, if, if you're in, in within the area and are able to come, we would absolutely love to see you there. Um, so we have, we have three days, um, uh, one at our trial site at Woolpit, um, which is our, where all of our cereals breeding goes, carries, is carried out. Um, another one at our HQ at Rothwell on the 5th of July, and then finally one at the end of July in Perth in Scotland. So we have all of these varieties there that Liam's gone through today. 
Um, we also have all of our we have our seals portfolio there as well. We've got some new varieties coming through. We'd absolutely love to see you face to face, um, uh, COVID permitting. So if you'd like to go to those and an opportunity to interact with us face to face, um, please do register your interest and keep an eye out for um, uh, further reminders. And just finally, as a reminder, for your basis and Naroso points, there will be an email come out um, shortly after this session where you need to submit your details um, uh, uh, on that to claim the point. Um, and that's all from us today. Thank you ever so much for listening. It, we do appreciate it. Liam, thank you ever so much for your your expert guidance going through um, the traits and, and the varieties that, that we have. Um, uh, and we look forward to seeing you soon.